Welcome back to Cosmic Brilliance. I have waited almost a year to interview a lovely gentleman, our guest today, named David Lotherington. He first became public on January 11th, 2021, as a Secret Space Program soldier living in Nova Scotia, now Canada. He has been involved with Secret Space Programs his entire life, starting at four years young and then 20 and back, which makes him over 300 years old. From 16 to 19, he was in the Earth Defense Force and many other programs. Today, we will be covering his awakening, his shape-shifting abilities that I got many questions from my subscribers wanting to know more about, how one in their previous life can design their starseed genetics for this life and help with the ascension and human collective consciousness. David is unquestionably a starseed with an unusual birth that ensures his abilities would have been activated in this life. His other abilities include telekinesis, psionic reading, remote viewing, psychic surgery, Akashic record reading, healing, implant and entity removal, Reiki practitioner, teacher, and telepath with multiple species. David is also proficient as an accurate channeler and integrates his higher self, lovely Cal, on a regular basis. He is a member of a divine collective called the House of L, which is E-L. This collective are all eighth dimensional beings on a total scale of nine dimensions and includes previously ascended beings I'm sure you've heard about, such as Archangel Michael, Jesus or Yeshua, Mary Magdalene, Buddha, Merlin, and Cal, David's higher self. Some refer to these high level beings as angelics and or ascended masters. He is also a Melchizedek priest. David began his awakening at 30 years young and his abilities appeared in waves. The more he healed himself and others, the more skills and memories came forward. So that is one of the reasons he's dedicated to helping others awaken as well. As mentioned multiple times on my shows, many of the movers and shakers of history have reincarnated now to be here for this end game ascension time on planet earth, referred galactically as sun three. And David has certainly had some interesting historical past or more appropriately simultaneous lives that I noticed centered on similar archetypal themes such as warrior, strategist, philosopher, and teacher. Four such parallel life incarnations of David were Achilles, Marcus Aurelius, Lancelot Tulak, and Sun Tzu, author of The Art of War. That being said, David does not choose to dwell on those lives as he recognizes the more important focus is the ever-present now. Thus, he prefers to dedicate his time to those who are interested in self-empowerment, improvement, and their overall well-being. Very much benefited, I may say, by his mentoring and attending his training school called the House of L. Thank you so much, David. It is truly an honor to have you here with your super busy schedule. And I know you do not do many interviews. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Marilee. And you did wonderful. <laughs> that sounded fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. We're going to have fun. <laughs> and, and folks, he's also currently still running missions. All right. So... You know, it's, it's a blessing to have him here at this time. Now, David, in your first interview called Recall of a Super Soldier, when you first came out, you said you were always the black sheep in your family. And I think many of us can relate to that. Yep. You would hang around with different groups and belong to none. So please describe your awakening, which you said began at 30 years young, because this will take us into... Uh, further stages. And I think people need to know a little bit about you first. Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> at the time I was working in pharmacy as a pharmacy assistant, I had just gotten out of being a paramedic and I, I was actually married at the time <laughs> uh, years ago. Um, I've gotten divorced since then, but um, my wife at the time actually showed me this video of Galactics on YouTube. And I was like, what's all this? And uh, I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. And I said, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And one video led to another video and led to another video. And before I knew it, 
I was looking up channeling videos and, and my wife at the time didn't want me to do this. She didn't want me to be a healer. She didn't want me to awaken. Um, so while I was on lunch breaks at work, I would research channeling information and whatnot. And eventually, you know, the, the, the bond between us broke because she want, she wanted me to stop growing and I wanted to keep going. Um, and that's essentially, well, there's a lot more to it than that, but, um, (laughs) yeah, that was the very beginnings. That is very understandable because that's even happening now. If you're with someone, the frequency is not enough in alignment with, it's just going to eventually start. Take us through your experience of, I think you, it was when you were 30 years old from some previous shows where the whole story about your father's DNA was taken and was used aboard a ship called Kalandi. Take us through that whole journey because it's so fascinating. Oh, that actually occurred over a period of time for me. Um, in the very beginnings, I had my clear abilities were extremely weak. I, um, I would receive um, songs that I hadn't heard on the radio or on television in some time. They would come through and I would hear this song over and over and over again. And that, that was exactly what was going on in my life. But I didn't realize until I looked up the lyrics of those songs. And as my ability started to grow stronger, I seeked out a crystal shop where I met this wonderful gatekeeper, you might say. She welcomes in people that are not initiated into this stuff. And I met this wonderful woman. She practiced telepathy with me for like three hours a day. And I learned a lot about myself and uh, I started taking Reiki and I eventually became a Reiki master. But um, just tying that back to the question, um, how did I find out? Well, actually, I have a picture. My father raised me kind of watching Star Trek as star anything. And um, he drew this painting before I was born. So this was made in um, 1980. And, you know, my dad has only painted a few pictures in his entire life. And this was one of them. And you have to think like, what makes someone choose to paint something over something else? Because you can paint literally anything you want in life. Uh, But he chose to paint this spaceship. But um, I don't want to say too much of my father, but um, he had um, an attraction to galactics. I could tell from television. And he couldn't explain like why, but I believe that it was because he was abducted by Pleiadians and um, taken, and that's how the genetics got taken from him. So that was the beginning of this whole process. Okay, because I was going to ask you uh, that many super soldiers come from a long particular lineage Mm -hmm. and that you reincarnate into family lineages that can activate the bodies. We'll talk about that. But I was going to ask you what you knew or can talk about your mother's and your dad's DNA. So I can talk a little bit about it. My mom has some saurian DNA. Um, Pterosaurian is um, like a reptilian DNA. My And she has some Yael DNA as well. Um, they're like a gray human hybrid species. But my dad has a lot of Pleiadian DNA. Actually, it's Plejarin, which is a species of Pleiadian. And that was a curiosity for me for a long time. I never knew where he got it from because he has a large chunk. Um, so I started to use my intuition and meditation. I started to get into that. And I found out that four generations ago, my dad, uh, my great, great, is it, I think it's three greats with four generations, but um, grandfather, he was abducted by Samyase, which some of the people in this field know about. And she, gave her genetics to the Lotherington lineage. Oh my goodness. And that gets into the whole parallel of you working with her and three others. Yeah. I still work with her now. Yes. You're one of the few that can handle her. (laughs) Yeah. You have to understand her, her but you have to understand her, right? Yeah. Uh, We might have time to get into that. Some Jossie Mm -hmm. in the research world, uh, is a very prominent person who Mm. pops up a lot in Billy Meyer's work 
mm. in the past and photographs and she's very fiery yes. she likes control and power yeah and um he's on the team of four brilliant super soldiers with semiasi and simone yes semiasi simone you and then one other male right or something uh just mainly me semiasi and uh simone yeah. Yeah, and Simone, Simone, you're related to, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so the I'm related are... to Simiasi too. They're sisters. Okay. Yeah. There you so, go. yeah. So they have a. We have a job. Um, I'm not always with them all the time, but on probably every few months, I would say, we go on mission. Their responsibility and delegation is to uh, monitoring non-human species that live on Earth. So what they do is they'll take their craft, they'll park it outside of an atmosphere. Um, so it's like a biodome, you might say, but it's um, holographically cloaked and it's a force field, which can contain an atmospheric environment of so pressure and flora and fauna that can exist within this system. And we would go in and we would monitor to make sure that the flora and fauna aren't interfering exterior to the force field and to make sure that everything in that ecosystem is still in balance. Okay, so you're saying that an ecosystem is created in a bubble reality mm -hmm. for you to put ETs that are trapped here? Is that, isn't there a story about they're, that they get trapped here? Yeah, they're not necessarily trapped. I, some of them would be, but most of them are just seeking refuge. Okay, from their worlds or mm -hmm. that have been destroyed. So you provide environments and put them in there so they can continue their life in a beautiful bubble environment. Is that what you're saying? Essentially, yes. And they're far enough away from all humanity that they're not influencing them in, a, in any way. Ah, which is important in changing timelines and all that thing. Yeah. Okay. okay, fascinating. Thanks for adding that. And... Um, Okay, so let's get back to the spaceship called Kalandi. All right, and because that, what I think had an interesting influence on you, right? And Definitely. you also were doing, they were doing genetic work on the children. And I, I would like you to talk about that, what was involved there. Okay, so the Kalandi is a craft that's located, it used to be located about one mile off of Tijuana and um, off up the coast of Mexico. And it's essentially a rather large craft that is uh, hired by humanity, uh, the secret governments, I suppose you might say. And um, they- Tax dollars. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tax dollars good, put to good use. Um, they essentially buy viruses from the Kalandi and those viruses are used to create super soldiers. So this so is they, called DNA, ET DNA infusion, virus infusions? or So or there, there's two things. There's two ways to improve super soldiers. You can do them through viral enhancement, or you can do this through implantation, which is usually cybernetic in nature. So viral enhancement is organic enhancement. Um, I prefer organic always over cybernetic. I don't believe in cybernetic implants to improve things personally, but um, there are many different species that work on the Kalandi um, that are specialists and they essentially are living in that bubble, just like any other species uh, that Semyasi or Simone would monitor. And, um, but they're just living on their craft instead. Now, people I know who have taken some um, DNA enhancements. Mm -hmm. uh, some were given a lot of different ones and uh, it was hard for them from my viewpoint to see them stabilizing as a being because it's pretty powerful. So what's your experience with all that? And so are you saying you went to Kalan D to get a viral enhancement? Is that what? Yeah, that happened, yep. Okay. Okay, and are you able to talk about what that was and what it create helped you with Somewhat. soldiering? Yes, I don't know exactly the the exact effect of the viral enhancement that I received, but it was because of a reward for working for a certain program for a period of time. Okay. Um, I have 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, 15% Plejarin DNA, 11% Lupine, 6% Terrasaurian, 4% Yael, and 1% Arcturian, which is 37% total. I've been told that I have more, but I believe those are the true numbers. Most people on earth have about 2% or less galactic DNA total. Um, but galactic DNA helps in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is um, it allows your DNA to hold more light, to hold more energy. And that means a, a more powerful soul can incarnate into that body. And if it's more powerful, then it's more conscious, it's more aware. And that means you have access to higher dimensional energies as well. That is really important mm -hmm. to know that's that. the That's the main reason why you'd want more galactic. And I understand that that has been worked on in the human form so that you can have vi higher vibrational beings incarnate in and have enough coherence to, to be able to exist here too. Is that part yes. of that? Yes. Yeah, so perhaps 60 years ago or so, there were a lot of earlier generations of indigos and other star seeds that would come through, but there was a lot of flaws um, because of the difference in frequencies and perhaps not the best genetics for the, their soul. Um, so they became a little bit crazy, wonky people, you might say. Um, but as the generations of humanity changed, they became more and more refined. And so, folks, this has been done in the background, right? Yeah. On on ships, in councils, this this genetic altering and enhancement, some dehancements, but mostly enhancements, uh, has been going on for what thousands of years, millions of years. I would say probably thousands, hundreds, definitely, but yeah, less so thousands. I would say. So your enhance now, when we hear the word virus, especially recently, a lot of people you know, we'll get nervous. So there are viruses that are positive. It's not necessarily the virus that's positive, but the virus is, um, uh, I don't quite have the vocabulary for this, but um, negligible. It doesn't really do anything, but it can carry DNA from other species and use it as a transit uh, to put into the new DNA. And so that alters the DNA and that, that, that carries with it the ability of the species you're putting in. Yes. Okay. That's really important, right? Mm -hmm. So don't a lot of super soldiers want viral enhancements and. Yeah, of course. So, aha, uh -huh. but you have to go do some fantastic thing like you did to get rewarded to get that, right? <laughs> Essentially, or you have to know the right people or be born in the right families, et cetera. Right. So this is why lineages are so important. Okay. So they work on, so on Kalandi, if someone was there, they would see children being worked on. It's more of a fetus level that okay. they work on with the Kalandi. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned the lupine species. Sure. And your introduction of your soul buddy called <laughs> Yang Shi. And um, because this ties into what we're talking about. And I want you to explain the lupine species, who they are briefly, and then we'll get into more specifics later and how that is different than dog, man, werewolves, whatever. Yeah. And then what your past life was. Okay. And then how you created this. So I'll guide you through it, but you go ahead. Okay, before we get started and we get too far off the Kalandi, I wanna bring forward two beings, just, just so you can see. This is Andromedan, actually. Oh, is it Andromedan? Yeah. So they have this purple um, energy above the top of the head, and paint can't really show it properly, but this is uh, what they look like. You made I, this. Yeah, I usually channel, and then I'll grab some clay, and then I'll make the whole thing all in one session. Okay, so that's an Andromedan as an aspect of you or an Andromedan that you met? No, that's an Andromedan that lives on the Kalandi. Oh, okay. Great. All right. And this is the loop, a lupine. Oh, they don't all look the same. Um, it depends on their genetics, but where do I get one of those? It's one of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> and you made that too. <clears throat> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So, so you want to hear about the lupine? Uh, you can intermix it with the clon whatever. Yes. Definitely. Okay. So 
the lupine come from Sirius B. They are a wolf race of they walk bipedally, um, though they can walk on four legs, of course. There are different variants of lupine as well. I've met several people that have contacted me that are different species of lupine from not Sirius B, but other areas of space, uh, but still within the Canis Empire. And uh, they're very interesting, but their technologies are different. Their um, aggression is a lot different as well is one thing I really noticed with them. But um, so how do I describe them? Um, there's two species that live together uh, peacefully with the lupine. One species is the royal lineage, which actually looks just like Anubis. Um, it's a jackal like species. So with the black skin, very thin profile, almost like a greyhound um, with the very pointed ears. Okay. So that's the royals. And so pointed ears, tall pointed ears are a sign of the royals too, right? Aren't they? They are. And, and because the royals have pointed ears, the culture of the lupine also replicated that and they started to breed taller pointed ears into their culture. So the royals are from another planet and they landed on the lupines planet and they kind of became um, not gods, but something like a godly presence on the planet compared to uh, the lupine, which are more naturalistic. They're more shamanistic. They're more tribal in nature. And they use their technologies and assist the lupine. Um, I don't know what to call them in difference from the royals, but any other hierarchy besides royal in the lupine is a different species. So they give them technologies and they use them. And that's how they can leave the planet. Otherwise, the lupines wouldn't have the tech to leave the planet. So it's a nice synergistic relationship. Yeah, actually... When I look at it, I'm like, oh, uh, it's kind of like a relationship of worship to the royals. Oh, oh. So it's more of a matriarchal, patriarchal relationship um, because the Lupin are very uh, hierarchical. They have an alpha and it's of utmost importance that one becomes an alpha in their culture because they are the ones that are allowed to breed. Hmm. Lucky for them, geez. <laughs> <laughs> they have to work really, really hard in all fields to get that. Frank. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we are showing, uh, there's up on screen, a, lu a lupine called uh, your buddy. You Yangshi. Yeah, sure. So Yangshi works on the Andera craft uh, with Ashtar Command. And actually... Well, he is white. He has scars on his body that are like pink. He has this, um, so his hair is whitish silver and his skin is a bluish tone and he has a lot of scars. And uh, because the Lupine are warriors, they tend to show their scars with pride. That's their accomplishments that they've achieved in their life. Uh, so it's more of a badge of honor for them. So instead of having them healed, which they could absolutely do, they choose to keep them. That's such a warrior thing. When I work on people's bodies and see scars, I say, I say oh, how wonderful. This is the map of your life. <laughs> and they go, that's a great way of looking at it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, boy, uh, talk a little bit about Yangshi's culture. Okay. Um I don't remember everything from that life, but I do know that they're very tribalistic, shamanistic. They use natural medicines. Uh, Yang, she showed me this technology that they use, which is very primitive, but it's like a beaver dam, if you can imagine that, uh, that they use to refrigerate food, <laughs> but there's no water involved. Interesting. And yeah. they're omnivores, right? Yeah, so they mainly eat insects. That's their primary source of protein. <laughs> but they eat birds and they also do eat some greens, but not much. They don't eat grass or anything like that. Flesh, I'm sure. Yes. yes. Any type of protein flesh-wise they would eat. Pretty much whatever a wolf eats here, they would eat. Okay, so 
he's your buddy because well we're brothers yes <laughs> <laughs> and we work together as well yeah there you go so this takes us to what is referred to as your most recent past life which is running parallel yes you might say that yeah so my past life in parallel, I worked on the Kalandi on this body that I have currently. And this is very quantum and it doesn't really make that much sense. Okay. Um, but essentially I was dying as a lupine. I was uh, quite tall, uh, between six and seven feet tall and very thin, maybe like 110 or 120 pounds. I was very emaciated um, and I knew I was dying. So but I was told that I have to continue with my mission by my captain, Marua, who is a Lyran, uh, which is a feline being. And I continued um, to work on my fetus, my own fetus that was taken from my father, uh, which is where it gets really trippy, um, to optimize. That's where I got my lupine genetics from, actually, because my dad doesn't have any lupine. My mom doesn't have any lupine in their natural line. So that 11% that I have is actually from me inserting my own DNA into my own fetus, which allowed the transference of the soul more easily from that body into this body. This is so cool. This is so cool because I have a feeling in higher realms, this has done a lot. And it also gets into shape-shifting a, a little later but this is so important and i have not heard this specificity from anyone else so if i have this right and th then you can keep adding you basically again folks all time is simultaneous more or less so that's what we're using here but you basically went a little you're dying as a lupine beautiful lupine species and you're approximately how old because most et species live a long time that's true but not the lupine they they may live for about 120 years about okay yeah. so you're dying and your feline lyran 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 uh commander so to speak or boss says we still need you can't die Sorry. And not only that, but you got to go to earth. Major bummer. <laughs> <laughs> he was my captain. And yes, he said, I have to continue my mission because it's not done yet. Okay. And um, so you more or less, is this right? You went forward in time, uh, extracted from your father DNA. So it, this all happens at the same time. Right. So my dad's genetics are taken. I'm, I'm working on the genetics for like nine years as a lupine. And then the fetus or which is it's beyond it's before fetus is inserted into my mom. And then I'm grown naturally in her womb. Okay. Can you talk about the, the nine years of working on that? Do you have any memories? Cause that has to be incredibly complex. And obviously mm -hmm. you're a geneticist. In several lives I am. Yeah. Yes. But yes. in this life, I'm definitely not. Yes. So the details are very few and far between. So, I mean, there's a lot of experimentation, seeing what works, getting DNA to work together to create. Yeah. A so it, a lot of it has to do with harmonies. Yes. So you'll have to be able to find the right DNA that works together with other galactic DNA is one of the main challenges of DNA infusions uh, when I work with beings. Um, but it's getting the frequencies right so that they coalesce together properly so that there's not um, free radicals. Uh, it's difficult to put in the words, but they essentially bounce off of each other and cause destruction of the nervous system. So it becomes incompatible to have a soul in it. And then the fetus is no good. So do you have a high tech ability or your own lupine ability? I would imagine has very good hearing to hear the sounds of the different frequencies so that if you know that they will be marriageable or coherent or not. So I, I, I don't hear them. I, I do have good hearing as a human. Uh, I don't quite have perfect pitch, but I have near perfect pitch and um, I have pretty good vision as well. Um, it's 20 on five is my vision. In one eye is 20 on five and the other eye is 20 on 10. So it averages like 20 on seven. And, um, 
I great was night vision. Do you have great night vision? Yes, I do. Because yeah. I don't have the nick. I don't have the uh, tapetum lucidum, which is the reflective lens in the eye. But I do have very good vision at night. Yeah. Okay, so this is so fascinating. So, folks, this is fascinating to think. Not only are your missions multi generational. And that's why we have to do ancestral healing. But this is how far back that he designed, continued his mission, designed this wonderful body in front of you that you see with all these different, especially lupine and the species he shared so that he could continue his mission more effectively and also to shapeshift. <laughs> that's true. So I would say that... <clears throat> As far as frequency goes, rather than hearing them, I more, I feel them. So through empathy, clear empathy, and through clear sentience, I would feel frequencies. And that's how I can tell when a lot of people are not feeling well, or there's entities in your field or implants, I can sense that. Um, and then I can remove them. So that's usually what I do for psychic surgery. And what about telepathy? Telepathy is used all the time. Um, actually, my telepathy has matured a lot over the years, and now it's tell empathy, which is a combination of telepathy and empathy together, which makes a more, well, in truth, the more clear abilities that you have access to, the more dimensional your image is of whatever it is that you want to connect with. So if you have your clairsentience, claircognizance, clairvoyance, clairempathy, blah, 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 you have all the clairs. Um, you can use that to receive better telepathy than you would otherwise be able to access. And isn't that part of what you teach in your school? Yeah, How people it is can part. open that more and access that? Yep. Because telepathy is really the window to opening up the ability to channel, to be able to access communications with galactics, um, other humans as well. Isn't something I do less of, but I still can do animals everything yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. everything literally everything with consciousness or a soul you can communicate with telepathically that's so it's so beautiful now let's back up so you are a lupine and you're designing the beautiful hybrid body in a humanoid form because you know you're going to earth Mm -hmm. help earth and continue the mission because your mission i assume is what to waken up humanity as much as possible yeah yes which is needed big time yeah yes and actually actually i'm finding more and more of the purpose of my mission it's just uh on the side of awakening humanity's collective consciousness i'm also bringing magic and alchemy back onto the planet ah was that that merlin Merlin <laughs> Merlin brings a lot of the information on magic forward, but St. Germain is another big teacher of it. Uh-huh. And dragons as well. From people who remembered a little bit before incarnating here, because yep. most of the time it was blocked, they were shown, they said, little snippets of their future life. Like they weren't shown the whole thing because uh, they had to choose they weren't in the whole thing because it would take all the fun away i guess <laughs> yeah now, absolutely. so did this happen to you on the ship you knew you you would need you knew you'd be a super soldier you knew this stuff would happen to you you knew you'd need these special abilities mm -hmm. you were able to know all that before incarnating it yes yeah, so, so as it as a god as a spirit we can all do that. Every living being alive does that. They know what their parents are going to be like. They know that they're going to get beat up in eighth grade, that they're going to have poverty in their life. And they know all of the missions that they're going to have to accomplish and tasks they want to achieve and experiences they want to have. Um, it's the same like galactics aren't, well, there's different levels of galactics, of course, but they wouldn't exactly be able to see exactly everything that's going to occur in a life, but they can get a guideline um, by looking forward and backward through time. So this is so key because a lot of people are going through a lot of loss and they say, I find it hard to think that I would agree with that. You know, <laughs> everybody it, says the same it, thing. It was a child and I'm like, no, no, no. It's part of the, mm -hmm. 
part of the honing of the uh, strength of the soul and experience and yeah it it forms your character so for the first seven years of life has a lot to do with forming who you're going to be as a person because that's where most of the programming is done which segues us perfectly into <laughs> uh, it's, it's very true that the seven uh, up to seven years old generally i think they usually uh, su super soldier programs and secret programs usually take kids folks from four to seven because that's the time as he, he mm -hmm. said that you're not programmed yet so this right. is a really really key point so let's start there in your programming and how you were taken in and the wonderful descriptions of the shape-shifting training you had okay so to start i was born into the program knowing i was going to be into the program okay so that's a part of this but um children are alpha and theta state brain waves if i'm not mistaken and that is the same as being in the state of hypnosis so you're they're extremely suggestible to conditioning and programming during these periods of time I was in the program with specialists. Um, you have it listed there, I believe, but the, there's a lot of psychologists that deprogram all the human conditioning that you have and limitations that you may have. And they reprogram you telling you, you can do anything. And one of these things you can do is shape shift. That's how parents should raise the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's true I as well. Do, you know, instead of just always saying, oh, it's just your imagination, honey. You know, like, okay, mm -hmm. let's let's play with this, you know? Yep. Um, so, okay. So that's a really key point. Now, what was one of the, first, and like you said, psychologists, cognitive behaviorists, psychotherapists, mm -hmm. all that worked with you to make sure you stayed open. And they did that, which I thought was so fascinating because you were the first person I've heard this from. They started off when you're really young by showing you other people shape shifting films of other people shape shifting. Yep. Okay. And, and these, live as well. And live as well. So these are kids in the program or are they also adults yep. in the program they're showing you? There are adults, but they're in lab coats and they're very sterile people, you might say, that are psychologists and, you know. They do everything by their book and everything is numbered and monitored and regulated. But th there are a lot of children in that program. Not, I wouldn't say a lot, but um, less than 15, I would say. But I'm the ones that are actually flying that you see. Um, the children that are flying. So it's kind of funny because usually it's one kid that gets it and flying comes naturally to them. Uh -huh. And the rest of them are like, I don't get it. And they're like, it's easy. And then they'll hold your hand and then they will fly with you. And then you just get it as a kid. You're like, oh, I should have known that. That makes sense. It, it's a, oh, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. It's just an entrainment to a frequency um, and understanding that you're not limited uh, to do something like that. Which are so key. I love how you said that because one of the things I've asked people is, do you still have flying dreams? And almost, you know, like huge amounts of people have had flying dreams, but they say, oh, not anymore. Or when I got older, I didn't or something like that. But how you said that is so significant uh, that instead of struggling like, oh, gosh, just I have to do an ability. It's just a question of moving into the frequency. Yes, it's a that. shifting of frequencies. Yeah. And that that gets passed through touch. Also true. Yes, because. Uh, that's in, that's the entrainment. That's the clairsentience. It depends where the strength is of the child, but they can change their frequency to adjust to the friend and they can copy that frequency essentially and then just start flying. Oh my gosh. Okay. One of my agendas is I'm going to start schools for this or I'm going to help uh, people have schools for this. This is so cool. Uh, you're, you're probably doing that with adults, right? With the mystery school, yeah. For you, how did you do it flying? Was that your thing? Or what I can you levitate, but flying is um, more difficult. Definitely more difficult because there's too many factors uh, in comparison. But every time that I uh, have memory of from any super soldier life, I reach like this um, super Saiyan state, you might say, this ascended 
God state where you just know everything. You have the answers to everything. You just understand how to do what you need to do. And I always begin to levitate during that moment. And then my abilities go to 10. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, you're accessing your quantum knowing. Yeah. Just move into, oh, beautiful, beautiful, which has been blocked in most of us here on earth. And Too. it's probably a good thing for most people. <laughs> we get into lots of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that would be definitely true. Okay, so you had mentioned to me um, or on a show that you weren't that great at shape-shifting, but in my mind, what these people are going to see and learn in the pictures, woohoo! you are happening. So um, <laughs> talk talk to me or us about, and we have pictures here, folks, that we're going to share where he was so kind of him starting to shape shift. And then he's going to tell you about the creature he chose and why he chose that, et cetera. So go for it. Okay. So we mentioned previously that I was a looping before this life. So for me as a child, I remember that life more than I remember other lives that I've had. So I just remembered, oh, that was really fun. I'm going to look like that again. So that's where it began, the template. Plus you had that in your body because you made sure yes. that. Yeah, so that, that doesn't necessarily matter in this case. It just matters that the soul is capable of making the shift of frequency to change the hologram. Oh, okay. And then we're going to get to hologram discussion too of how sure. people manifest. But this this is so great. Thank you so much. You're such a delight. Okay. So um all right. So you pick something that you were familiar with, yep. which made sense. Now, how did that start? They say, okay, kids, now we're gonna do shape shifting and mm -hmm. pick a creature. Like how, yep. how pick your favorite through, animal. Take us through that. Pick your favorite animal. Some kids pick one girl picked an eagle, one guy picked a turtle. Um <laughs> They weren't all functional for what they had plans for them to do. And there was this one child that was exceptional at uh, shape shifting. So there's levels to shape shifting, as you may imagine. Um, some people are really good at copying something else. Like for an artist, some people are great at seeing something drawn out and then they just draw out the same thing. That's easy for them. But if you ask them to turn the figure and make them grab a ball or something, they will not be able to draw that figure. So it's the same with shape shifting in, the, in that way. Um, I could turn into the lupine because I remembered exactly what it was like to be a lupine. That form was familiar to me. But there was this child that was able to transform into this tiger-like uh, figure that had armor built into it that was absolutely not really like a tiger at all it was completely changed um, transmogrified is the term whoa that's a whole nother thing okay yeah. so now you said one kid turned into an eagle and so what would they use that for so that person was used for reconnaissance and gathering information that but i was sense. yeah and it's like a drone but it's yeah. alive. <laughs> That's what it was. And this is before drones were like really a thing. So it would be awesome. But and, um, my missions were mainly for assassinations. Oh, lucky you. Yeah. Okay. So what they were looking for, okay, if I have this right, what they were looking for, but they weren't going to tell you is, are you going to create a predatory predator species? Or are you going to create a prey species or something so, like a so turtle? The a turtle is like, what do you do with that? <laughs> right. So that child wasn't used in the program, the turtle, even though it takes a skilled ability to be able to shape shift at all. So they would be skilled in other things, definitely. But um, they would just let the kids pick what they want to pick and see if they can change into something more ideal for the program. But if they couldn't, then they would just use them for the animal that they want to use. So I was the wolf, which is like... Um, looks like a werewolf as you can see as in the images um that's not actually a perfect image so i used ai to create that but um my fingers were were different because they had um it's difficult to describe um 
you know, what, what a devil's tail looks like in the cartoon. It's kind of like pointed like Nightcrawler's tail. It was more like that. The fingers were more like that. Um, and they were programmed to be in, invincible. So I could claw through metal or I could open up crazy things with my hands. And the feet were impenetrable as well. And they also had raptor talons on the inside of the legs, which isn't in the artwork. Well, major kill claw there. Yeah. When you said they programmed it, did they through mind control or did you, did they take you through periods where you would program it and get it more sophisticated, more sophisticated, more sophisticated? So I would have, remember I said, there's certain types of stuff that you can, it's harder to recreate. Uh, it's harder to create something new than it is to just copy something. So for me, I could only like do the um, Raptor Talon and reformat the claws and I could make the tail appear or disappear whenever I want it. Um, but that was just small stuff compared to this Tiger Kid. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, now, how long a time did it take? I get that because it was so familiar to you, you were mm -hmm. able to manifest it, shift it in your, your hologram, so to speak. Um, if it wasn't familiar, what level of detail, like does someone have to study all the anatomy, all the things if they're going to no. shift? So this is a good topic. Um, it takes about six months to be able to condition the child just so you have a frame of time and you don't have to think of the internal structure because it's a hologram. It's like um, an empty shell. Oh. You don't have to worry about that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Describe that and describe hologram for people because some people may be familiar with the or living in a holographic reality others not so okay i want you to weave how that would work for them i'll, I'll do my best so we live in something called the matrix perhaps i i can talk from the top and we'll go through this process if you like so for i learned this from cal by the way cal is lives exterior to the matrix so he understands exactly how it works so the matrix encapsulates encapsulates uh, our earth and half of the moon approximately. If some, uh, let's just say you're, you're a spirit or a God, you're omniscient, you're omnipresent, you're omnipotent. And so that means you can do anything. And if anyone asks you a question, you say, sure, I know that answer instantly. But after a while you get bored and you say, huh, I know every answer. You tell me to find something. I know where it is instantly. I want to have some limits so that I can't access all this power. So you take a bit of your energy as a spirit and you put it into the matrix, which is like a coin going into an arcade machine, okay? And because your energy as a spirit goes into the matrix, everything in this matrix is modeled for you. And that's why everything in our life is a reflection of ourself. It's because this is our matrix. So because everything is a matrix, it's all digital. And you'll, you'll see like downloads. People will talk about downloads. That happens only in computers, you should know. And, and uh, the hologram essentially is any physical object is a hologram. So it's a projection of concentrations of certain energies, which makes up a hologram. And you can change that using alchemy uh, and you can reprogram the functions of certain things using alchemy. That's another story altogether. Oh, that'll be, that's interesting, but the holographic idea. So if I have this right, we as infinite creators, co-creators, once we, um, are evolved enough these are my words we get a little bored we go oh let's let's do something that has some limits or let's let's play some game or let's do this so the holographic reality is a way of inserting a fractal or shard or yourself into yep. it um you call it a sprite in a game i guess or something like <laughs> that but into it to to literally play out but you don't know you're playing a matrix to play out, be totally involved in it, 
to see what happens, what results happen and what occurs. And that would be called an experimental universal world matrix. Like it's a, it's an experiment ongoing, right? Well, you know exactly what's going to happen as a spirit, but you say, okay, the matrix is designed to control, to limit and to suppress your godliness. And actually the Cal force also does that. So we didn't really talk about Cal at all, but Cal- We'll, we'll get there. He's, he's the oversoul or higher self? Yes, both are accurate. Okay. And so, okay, we'll talk about Cal later. Um, but that limits you. We need limitation. Otherwise, if you remember everything from all your other lives, it's tough to want to live, actually, because you know everything and there's no purpose. You can just leave your body whenever you want. So you say, Ugh, I need limitation. So I don't remember my past life where I was destroyed by, you know, whatever. So you can have a fresh start and enjoy life. And freak yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> when you rediscover that you're already all these amazing things. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I love people to know is that this is just one part of themselves in a game mm -hmm. that the bigger part of them is free of that. Yes, game. that's true. And that's really important to know because most mm -hmm. people just identify themselves with this is it, this is the ego, this is all there is, and they get depressed, you know? Yeah, it's that's super limiting self-belief systems, yeah. The victim mentality, yeah. it doesn't help either. But they haven't been taught <laughs> these right. things with them. So this matrix, because there's multiple matrices, there's been matrices put up to limit us, but this matrix you're talking about is a source creator directed matrix for the game and, yes. and councils so this because is your energy as a spirit is in this game it creates the game perfectly for you but you're also that's so fascinating and that's why mantras work explain well because let's say it is my intention to have a wonderful day to experience great things and all the tasks and things i need to accomplish are done quickly and efficiently why would that work if you're just saying words on a normal basis? But because you're a God that puts your energy into this matrix, you can influence the matrix to actually bring those things into your life. What percentage of beings incarnating here to, to this planet for this game were dumped here because no one else wanted them? <laughs> Are evolved star seeds who are coming in on a mission, are multiple ET species, brothers and sisters out there that want to experience this, that might create greater unification if we're all in a, a particular kind of body form. Um, backdrop or kind of partially unsold people. You know, you know where I'm going with this. Like what percentage? Cal says it's 10% total of all Ten, that yeah so only 10 percent of the population has a soul in the body and he says the rest of them are npcs oh my gosh i've heard this before but i i haven't shared it because i don't want people to get depressed they i know have, that is a big right impact. where they yeah. think they're just like a, a sprite in a game but they have to also know there's so much bigger it's just this part of them right mm -hmm. yeah have, have, have Cal uh, explain a little bit more of that, if, if he would. Um, well, let me just, um, what part would you like us to explain? Well, just, just you know, this, this starts getting into kind of the oversoul, higher yeah. self. And I'm wondering, I was just recently introduced to the importance of the astral body also, mm -hmm. and then the physical body. So kind of from the top down. I know you. he's done a great show on that. Thank you, Cal um, and David. But how you can explain this in the context that you're playing a game? Well, the goal of the game is to have experience. Okay. Okay. So, but you, you like I said, your energy tailors the matrix to give you a certain experience, which is your goal. Whether this is um, to be... Uh, I don't want to say this dark word, but I will raped 
or whether it's to shoot somebody or whether it's to have fun and have sexual fun everywhere, um, whatever it is, that's you, that's on you as a soul that you want to experience. Um, but it's also related to your karma. So and karma free will. Yeah. and free will. So karma plays a big part in this. And let's say you want to have like, I want to be born into a billionaire's family and I want to be beautiful and I want to have all these skills and abilities and great connections, but you don't have good karma. Then they'll say, okay, well, this costs so many karma points and you don't have enough for what you want. So karma can be used for many things as a spirit to purchase. So let's say you're building your profile, okay? Okay you say, oh, my, my humor is going to be six out of 10. My strength will be five out of 10. My ability to be psychic will be three out of 10. All of these things are put into a profile. And then you essentially go around the planet as a spirit, seeing all the potential families that will fit your suit, your needs as a, as a God, see what experiences you're going to have. And then you pick a body. Mm -hmm. If you have bad karma, so Cal explains karma as there's a, there's a million uh, timelines. There's timelines and then there's karma. It's, it's very quantum and difficult to describe in a linear way. Okay, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, um, so that's karma. If you have bad karma, you're going to get the situation that you don't want to have happen. So wait, uh, hold on just a sec. When you say bad karma, are you talking about you've had more of your overall all lives and experiences more on the self service pole? Uh, you know, you'd get positive karma for doing that. So you lose karmic points for doing certain things. The worst thing you can do is torture somebody. That's the worst negative karmic point thing that you can do. Welcome. So being cruel, it, that's like the worst you can do. Okay. What what next? What are the like? I don't know the whole scale of everything. Is that killing is killing, or not it's actually killing? not that bad uh, okay. karmically. I don't really want to say that for everyone to know because yes, um, yes. we kill things all the time. If you scratch your arm, you kill tons and tons of bacteria. If you go for a walk, you, how many ants do you crush? How many, right. you know, insects do you hurt? So it seems intention would be relevant. It isn't. It is important. Yes. Here. Like if yeah. there was malicious intent, if it was revengeful mm -hmm. versus compassionate or, or there's something. Absolutely. Different... It plays a huge role in karma. Okay. But your karmic points are essentially tallied at the end of every life. And okay. as you enter the anti-life, I don't want this to get too crazy. I'm getting too no, crazy. No, no, no. Oh, keep going. Keep going. As you enter the anti-life after death, uh, assuming that you don't have belief systems like I'm going to heaven or I'm going to hell after I die. You will process that experience first, but after you go into this anti-life, the anti-life is where you process something called Bardo. You go through this process called Bardo. And this is like um, the explanation of everything that you've done in your life, why you've done it, and whether or not you're going to get a karmic point or have one reduced essentially. So some people that have done bad things like murdered people, after they die, they, they go back to the place where they did the criminal act so that they can relive this process, this experience of why did they do that? And they get almost stuck, some of them, because they can't get past why they shouldn't have done that. And that's how haunted houses are created, for example. Mm. So they go pass back to earth say or they create a, ho a hologram where they live that out from all the different vantage points so when you die i'm not dead but i hear this information from cal for anyone that's doubting this stuff is yes. he's just making this up thank you cal <laughs> <laughs> so the anti-life when you die you enter the anti-life equation and your consciousness gets dropped below third dimension so when mediums do channeling of deceased humans, um, they have to drop their frequencies down to communicate with these non uh, these human 
anti-life beings. And they are more primitive than humans. They will lie to you and they'll tell you things that aren't true and um, they can deceive and whatnot. And they get stuck emotionally. They don't have the vast emotional spectrum that we have. And they're more limited than we are as far as manifesting goes. Anyway, I don't know what we're talking about. Anymore. That's part of the soul trap thing that when you cross you over. You, you might can... say that you have to process all of your traumas before uh, going back to source. Okay. And that's where people get trapped. Because they're justifying it or they don't. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes or... they can't come to grasp with why they did what they did. And then they stay in this loop or they get lost in the post-plasmic layer or the quantum fluid, you might say. This is the where the astral is, and the Akashic records and stuff. So, so what would you recommend when someone crosses over, if they're able to do it somewhat consciously? What would I Cal think, recommend? I think that's a better question for Cal. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. in order to do that, I'll have to channel. So are, okay. is your audience familiar with what channeling is? Uh, they should be, but go ahead and give them a, a, a brief. Okay. So channeling is the entrainment of one's frequency to match that of another being. What happens is the entrainment is searching for another frequency, but after one entrains to one's frequency, they begin to harmonize. And that's when they find the same frequency. And the final process is coalescing. That's when two harmonies um, connect together the chakras align and you begin to channel a being. Um, so I'll go to the background. My consciousness goes to the background and Cal comes to the forefront. And then Cal's able to speak through me uh, to give you whatever answer you essentially need. Beautiful. So Cal is a 7.7 dimensional being that is Bisu consciousness. Any being that's over seventh dimension should be considered as a god because they are Bisu, potentially. Um, so what Bisu is, is there's linear consciousness, which humans have, and then there's quantum, which is the process of doing two or more things at the exact same time. <laughs> Your eyes are so big. And then there's Bisu consciousness. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> People go, your eyes are so intense. They, go, they are so oh, intense. <laughs> you know, I read, I read energy really well through the eyes, right? Do you want me to put my, my 3D? <laughs> put those back on. <laughs> oh, God. Got to keep this in the video, by the way. <laughs> we do? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go. Okay. So Cal's Bisu consciousness, which means he can go into any person's life and he can go through all of their timelines that exist in the now and all of their parallel realities, which just takes one moment of time. And then he can teleport out and tell you essentially what he's seen, which would take a thousand thousand years to do, but he can access information radically quick is what that means. And uh, Cal is known as the Cal force so the Cal force is present in all living beings that possess consciousness. And the Cal force works with the matrix to provide you with limitation so that you aren't a spirit anymore. You're a soul now. So Cal force turns a spirit into a soul. And without the Cal force, your spirit or soul at this point wouldn't be able to stay in your body. It would just leave. So that golden cord that people see is Cal. That's the Cal force. Is when this, they're doing astral is projection this the same and travel. Silver cord that connects the astral to the to the physical. Some yep. people say it's phys is silver, silver or gold. Yeah, that's Cal. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yep. Very yeah. interesting. Thank you. So because Cal is outside the matrix, he sees things very differently than any being inside the matrix would see it. As you can imagine. Lovely, because I'm into the bigger picture viewpoint and the top down, like so that we can understand this game. <laughs> yeah. So this is how I learned all this information about anti-life and karma and all of this. I learned it all from Cal pretty much. Perfect. Yeah. 
Sweet. Okay. okay. <sighs> and Cal and I are integrated about 25% currently. So he's always here, but and in order to get into the trans data channeling, it's just going to take me a moment to get there. Okay, hold, hold on just a sec, sweetie. Um, sure. Because you, uh, you and I both feel, but you have worked at this consciously of how we can bring our oversoul, higher selves, a higher part of us, more deeply connected to the physical body. Mm -hmm. So before you go into that, do you want to just briefly share your experience of what you notice differently when as that occurs more and more and more? While I'm in the trance state of channeling? Well, when or you have your as, higher, you integrate. as you're integrating, not necessarily channeling, just as you've integrated Cal more into your... So th this is not the first integration that I've had. The first one was Christ consciousness. And this happened after I reached uh, my master level Reiki. It was kind of copied to me from another person that has Christ consciousness. And that radically changed my life, I have to say. Um, it cut my ego in half, definitely. I was much more service to others in my life. I didn't care about things like going to the ball game anymore. I didn't care about playing poker with the boys anymore or doing mundane things. Sorry if you do those things, I apologize. But I, I stopped caring for things that don't have meaning in life. And I cared about the mission, my purpose, and what I was here to do more. A so depth it, of being more deeper, yeah. Yeah. And it's the same with Cal, more or less. I'm a lot more calm and reserved. Um, I can access Cal all of the time. So if I have a question, I'll just ask him, and then he can give me an answer. But when it's trance uh, channeling, I you can speak to him directly. It's much more clear. There's less layers of experience in between Cal and I. Um, and these layers provide some sort of resistance to the information clarity. So, yeah. Because he's coming into the matrix. Right. Okay. Getting turned. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank sure. You. All right. I'll bring Cal through. Ah, <clears throat> a greetings. Uh, we are Cal. Greetings, Cal. Thank you so much. And I know you have been present in a manner of speaking through this entire show. Yes, that is correct. And so appreciate your input and would like to continue what we start what you started discussing and sharing through David about the things that we really need to know at this point down here with the afterlife, with our decisions, and the the viewpoint of the game here. Feel free to, to um, elaborate uh, on two things specifically. One is the afterlife. Where should be the focus, concerns, what happens? And, and let's begin with that, shall okay. we? Okay, yes. So this is a large answer, as it is a quantum process that occurs after one's death. After one dies, they go through the process of elimination of processes that are not relevant to being processed in Bardo. This is a Tibetan practice, as you may know, of what occurs after you die. And there are several phases to this process as well. But essentially, one is able to levitate above their body and see who is at their uh, death sight, you may say. Sometimes they linger souls, and sometimes they transmute immediately into other layers of experience, as they don't have that much karma to process. But this processing is required for nearly all souls to do, uh, unless they have some connection with portals, which allows them to mitigate this process. Uh, let us scratch the eye just one moment, please. Ah, apologies. So this process of elimination allows one to only process that which is important. It removes all redundancies, such as 
going to work every day for 40 years at the same job, that would be a lot of processing and a lot of boredom as a, as a soul. So that is all removed from the processes. And that is what we mean by the elimination process. Um, do you have a further question? Because there is a lot to this. Yes, I'm. I, we're following. This is fascinating. So you drop the extraneous stuff and yeah. narrow, narrow in on the processes that are uh, imperative for the karma and future evaluation. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Or, and then so continue with that. Ah, so the karmic process is tallied. It is a plus and minus system, a binary system, you might say. Ones and zeros. Apologies. If one has positive karma, then in the next life, they will have more karmic points that they can apply to applicable uh, places of resource, like physical body uh, looks, or perhaps ability, or perhaps talents, or perhaps financial uh, family uh, situations, you might say, or perhaps neighborhoods that they grow up in, whether they are good or bad. This all plays into having positive karma. And negative karma comes into play when usually when one's soul believes that they should suffer a little bit uh, because they were not a good person in the past life. So they tend to incarnate into poor neighborhoods or they tend to do more mundane things with their life, or perhaps they get hurt or damaged uh, throughout their body from traumas and things of this nature. So that is the effect of karma uh, in a nutshell, you may say. Okay, so, you know, thank you so much for that. Um, I felt that a lot of people's karma is because they hadn't fully forgiven themselves. Yes. So you brought up a very interesting point, because I feel that, Karma can be nullified from a multidimensional perspective, but also if you've done what you can to make peace with others and totally forgiven yourselves. Is there any validity in that? That is absolutely true, yes. So it's when people who are tend to, souls tend to be hard on themselves and when they evaluate and go, oh, I really blew it or I'm not comfortable with that, or they will take upon themselves some experience to uh on the negative polarity yes and polarity does also play into this scheme so there are those that have more negative polarity and there are those with more positive polarity if you have more positive polarity then it is likely that you are more likely to be service to others and if you're more negatively polarized then you will be more service to self and you will be let's talk about negative polarity first Beings with more negative polarity are more likely to be mischievous. They are more likely to be tricksters or have jokes and jest. They are more likely to be able to hurt someone and not feel terrible about it. They may be more uh, manipulative in uh, how they attain the things that they do and care less for hurting people uh, more so than someone of positive polarity. So people with darker polarities perhaps in the 70th uh, to 30 range, swaying towards the darkness uh, polarity, they're more likely to be in the mafia. They're more likely to be um, people that hurt people, uh, criminals, and people that take from others, um, and drug dealers and things of this nature, usually people with darker polarities. And whereas people with lighter polarities tend to do things like be teachers, they tend to be doctors and nurses. They tend to be service to other roles, even librarians. And uh, any job that you may have that may help others would be encapsulated within that, most likely. That makes total sense. Now, there's no judgment about light or dark. It's this, this experiment or game has been set up to experience all of that and the limitation that provides. Is that correct? Yes, that would be accurate. However, there are points gained. So, yes. So that shows some form of evaluation or tallying system. <laughs> that is the comma. So oftentimes uh, those with more dark polarities have a very visceral youth. They grow up in an abusive family. 
or they are traumatized heavily by different things in their youth, whether it be their environment or sexual relations or uh, relationship with their parents and whatnot. But they tend to use this trauma to help them as it is a lesson to help them to drive them forward to success. And that is how they like to view the world, the darker polarity beings. Mm -hmm. Power, success, all of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there really isn't any judgment. So is there some that like tally their systems and keep going back because it's fun for them to do that? To do an Oh, age? yes. So it, Earth it doesn't provides... become an addiction is my, my question here. In some way, yes. One thing you should realize from a higher perspective is that you cannot do all of these dark things on other planets. It is not permitted. So in higher dimensional consciousnesses, beginning approximately in the fifth dimension, there is a limitation to being allowed to kill animals or perhaps other humans or perhaps causing a rape of someone or perhaps um, beating someone nearly to death. This is something that can only occur in lower dimensional experiences, but it is in many of the humans that have incarnated that wish to experience these more dark and more visceral experiences. So yes, they tend to wish to repeat certain things within that potentiality. And if there was to say there's a goal of this game of limitation, is the goal is to perceive and what you're sharing with us to perceive that it's just a game. It's not totally you. And would you say it's a balance of dyna dynamic balance or neutrality? Is there like a goal? Like what creates the ascension process for us? Well, that is several questions, actually. Yes, it is. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So start the goal. What's the goal? The goal is to have a wonderful experience while you are incarnated. That is the only goal, actually. Wow. Now that's fascinating and simple. Okay. Yes, it is that simple. There are beings that have missions within that experience of life, which is like service to others, like ground crew members, you might say, that say we have a mission to increase the consciousness of humanity, for example. That is an accelerant of one's karma, you should know. And it is programmed into the soul knowing that this is their purpose, this is their drive, this is what makes them, that will make them happy if they choose to do such a thing. It is a, a hidden code, you might say, in the program to do such a thing. Right, because it's very oriented towards others in service. Yes. So in super soldier programs, almost everyone gets conditioned by torture. So yes. how can that be having fun? <laughs> that was the older format of the conditioning program, yes. But that is done for a reason, to isolate certain aspects of consciousness from the main body of, or the soul from, um, you might say, disassociative identity disorder is a disorder where the, the soul is, is fractured. And in this fracturing, there are many identities that are created, which live within a, a system. This system, uh, each of these consciousness or particles, or fractals, they serve a role, a function within that system to provide success for the individual, which is, you might say, the oversoul or the, or this, the collective of that individual. So, uh, and once a consciousness is separated from its uh, main system, it can be programmed with particular functions. Oftentimes, higher particles of consciousness are separated as well. And we see that we are, we hope we are not losing you a little bit. No, you're not. A uh, very good. Y yes. Well, I understand they use torture to bring forward people's abilities and to move more into their multidimensionality. Yes. So the reason for the torture is to fractalize the consciousness in hopes that they will ac gain access to a higher dimensional part of that collective consciousness. When one connects to the higher dimensional component of that consciousness, one is able to condition that 
consciousness, which has abilities that lower dimensional consciousnesses do not have. And that is the reason for all the trauma. Right. It's like kind of the end goal is to be more multidimensional, fuller abilities, more your actually truer self as a God yes. being. That is true. And that is what the programs wish to attain from you. And I, I would agree that that, uh, that makes sense to me. However, there's also a part of me that goes, isn't that possible through love and a different form of teaching? Yes, that is correct. And that is how the channel has reached their levels of um, attainment in the super soldier program, you might say. Not everyone has been conditioned in the older program ways. Uh-huh. Okay, good. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that. Okay. So the overall goal is to have as much fun and to experience as much whatever you have agreed to experience. That is correct. Okay. Now, at the same time, how can you explain to people? So they have a fractal or a portion of themselves projected into this uh, computer game, so to speak, or holographic game. Yes. And the majority of them, okay, meaning what? Other parallel lives, over soul, higher self, are all in the more authentic, real, spiritual reality? Uh, we are not seeing the question. Okay, so so what I want people to do, what, what I'm hoping for people is that by increasing their awareness of what this game's about, who they really are and why they're here, that their fear will dissipate. It does, yes. As you ascend through consciousness planes, you lose fear and you gain confidence. That is normal. Yes, and so you're more effective in every way also, you, right? You, yes, you are more enlightened, which means you are able to access higher dimensional energies and higher dimensional components of yourself, which you can bring down into the third dimension or density. And that helps you to apply that to help others, which further accelerates your growth. Okay, now is the, the goal of an oversoul, the goal may not be the right word, but is the, so we have oversoul, higher self, you know, astral body, physical body. So is the goal of the overself to try and bring all the parts, all the multiple parallel lives are the goal of the higher self, all the parallel lives that it's chosen to separate out to experience maximum diversity, all at a point of balance and back to itself as one? Ultimately, yes. So this is not perceivable by a linear consciousness, but from a quantum perspective, one can perceive all lives simultaneously occurring alongside each other in different layers of dimensionality and frequency, you might say. As this occurs, there is one point where the soul retracts all of its particles from all of its parallel lives, all at the exact same moment, and reunifies them together to create what you know as the oversoul. And then you may remove your quarter from the machine, and then you may put it in another machine whenever you are ready. Hmm. Okay, and beautifully said. So the oversoul is, would this be a, a way of saying it, is just a one fragmentation off of source creator all that is energy the oversoul is that yes is that okay okay that's really clarifying thank you so much cal now so we have that as this game and to remind people that this little fractal down here is playing a game of limitation but is a small fraction of who they really are that's very important for them to know that is very correct yes and they are absolutely omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent beings, but they are the masters of their own limitation. And so what they believe is that we are a limited flesh-based being that has no power and we have no control over our lives. And because of this, we must suffer. And that is something that is not good to think. No, and also the real, some of the religious programming around that also, yeah. That is tremendous, yes. Mm -hmm. 
in a negative, okay. tremendous way. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So, and since all time, so to speak, this is over simplistic, is all simultaneous, we've already succeeded and all folded back into oversoul. We've already done that. We've done it all. Yes. Cool. <laughs> So there's no reason to freak out because we're already successful. <laughs> that is correct, actually. That's what I've said since I was a little girl. I, I would tell people I come from the future where we're already successful. <laughs> that was my way of saying it. <laughs> that is very wise of you. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, so this is just like how you keep a, a God being entertained and continual soul growth <laughs> yes pretty much uh, in continual soul fun you would say in continual soul fun oh because you all have already grown to your absolute perfection as a spirit yes and we're then then we're working backwards pretending we're not yes okay so to to help people with the afterlife that we had started on Yes. Uh, so we're talking then for these people are all we're talking for Earth, the matrix game that people are in. How do they liberate themselves from that? Do they need to liberate themselves from that? In other words, what's the awakening ascension Earth whole story about? Well, there are different chapters to this story. Mm hmm. And each soul, depending on their delegation and of character, has a different definition of success in the matrix. For example, for the ascended masters that are present on the planet currently, their definition is to become a god while in the matrix. Ooh, yes, because that's like the ultimate challenge. That is the ultimate challenge. Yeah. But for many others who are on different chapters of their developmental course, they believe that I must escape this reality. I must escape this matrix. But this is a flawed mindset because you have put yourself here. Well, right now, uh, yes, I, I, it's, it's understanding that there's no real victim in this yes. situation. But it's but it's understood that people don't know that because they've been shut off to the truth of their being based on limitation. Yes. And they must remember their capabilities to be able to attain such abilities. So is it true that in general, at what's often referred to as the fifth era of man or whatever, and during this time, we are in a ascension what's called an ascension opportunity and an awakening opportunity is that correct that is always correct even in the first and zero dimension that is correct so that's kind of the game so the game is to go into any game do the trip freak yourself out experience everything you want have fun and and ascend back to the awakening of who you are yes in a nutshell yes <laughs> okay all right so um, what do you advise that would provide wisdom and comfort for people? Not a, let's start in this life as they are living right now. We would say to them, you are not a slave. We believe that that encapsulates a lot of things for a lot of people. But many people believe that they were working their nine to five jobs and 40 hours per week and that they are enslaved to a master with a social insurance number that gives them their identification codes of life. And as long as they are generating taxes, they are paying the man, you might say. That man that controls them and creates limitations for them, making it impossible for them to ever achieve anything. That is something that we want you to let go of, that you are not a slave, but you are a sovereign individual. You are a powerful God, even, that is capable of attaining many levels and capabilities of strength, sovereignty, and achievement in one's life. And the only limitations you have actually are ones that you put in front of yourself. That is what we would say. 
That is so, so beautiful, succinct and profound. So why are we all educated in certain movements that this is a slave planet? Do they mean that it's a planet where you get to explore limitation and that includes the slave game? Would that be more accurate? Perhaps a more accurate definition, but it is multifactorial. There is reasons why some souls incarnate into Earth um, to receive limitations because they are malevolent souls. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's part of their karma thing or and free will yes. choice? Both. Okay. And this goes beyond many human understandings, but there are systems in place designed for those that are the most malevolent that are the most benevolent to experience certain types of realities the most malevolent of souls the darkest hearted individuals are put on certain places to incarnate into certain systems some of them incarnate onto earth this is the present planet concept that one knows of but there are other systems in place as well that allow for the most beautiful uh, poli politicians and um, light-hearted champions of the light uh, that are also placed here as well to almost battle, you might say, each other. So it is more like an arena, more than a prison, we believe. Ah, oh, kind of a boxing ring, <laughs> the gladiators of old. <laughs> yes, light versus dark. And if one can attain their sovereignty, then they are becoming a champion of this reality. But if they are conquered and enslaved by that which surrounds them, then they become a slave and they are dark. Uh, yes, because most have been trained to give their power away yes. to the system or anything. Yeah, yes. Okay, and also people have multiple fractals, no matter if they're light or dark. And so that's what you were saying is that this is one reality that is very intense because it's based on limitation. Yes. But, but uh, okay, question. Did everyone who's here agree to be here? Yes, absolutely. Without any restriction. Okay. So it wasn't like they were told you have to go there. Some were told that but they all ultimately decided, yes, I will go. Okay. All right. So that level of free will is respected. In other words, they can put it off as long as they want, but it's a good idea to do this. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so maximum exploration, maximum experience to the whole. Maximum fun, maximum experience, yes. Yes, I agree. I love fun, fun and playfulness, yes. Okay, so uh, when, what does one do? So when one awakens and realizes they're no longer a slave and, and all of that and works, are they then free from the matrix system when they cross over called death, even though there's no such thing? Well, they are always free, actually. Okay. So you don't need to die to be free. Okay, because some have that belief system. We have many. so many um, people choosing to take their lives right now, and especially young children. And it, I think, understandably, it's because they're taking this life too seriously, in a way, and a lot of other things going on. Um, so uh, what happens? Is there um people have asked me is there any judgment about that and i've you know about that choice and i go i don't think so but it depends and it depends on how the person feels who did, and why they did it what was yes. could you give about that regarding children suiciding mm -hmm. a little bit of a dark subject don't you think yes but a concern for a lot of parents to try and work with their their children more so that doesn't happen Unless it was agreed upon. I mean, I can understand maybe it was agreed upon for the parents to have a loss or something like that. Ultimately, yes, that would be what it comes down to. But we would say that good parenting has to do with good communication, good understanding, good spending time with their child, 
it may be due to a lack of emotional intelligence on the behalf of the parent who did not receive enough love in their life to understand how to emotionally connect and relate to their child properly. And that ultimately leaves a, a void between the child and the parent or the child and their siblings or whatnot. Emotional intelligence is a factor that more humans should be aware of and that too many humans are lacking it, which leaves them to be unemotional, to not hug, to not be compassionate for others, to not uh, be able to have a good conversation with someone or a deep level of conversation, which allows them to isolate themselves ultimately in the future because they think that they can't win a conversation. And that causes people to live by themselves and die alone ultimately, which is a not very fun life. Yes, the three uh, children I know of their parents were exceptional. What I did is I went over to a high school to find out and I asked uh, key different students, what is the hardest thing for you in high school? And they all answered me the same, Cal. And what did they say? They all said, it is hard for me. It's hard to be me. Ah. It's hard to be me. And so, of course, this will take us into, you know, a class that's needed because once you can understand that, but they all said the exact same thing, no matter who they were at different times. And because, but the, here's the trick. They don't know who me is. Most of these children uh, get affected too much by peer pressure. Yes, we believe they may be saying, my life is hard. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is the translation of their words, but they don't know how to frame it. Oh, yes. But that may mean they have parents that are working so much that they don't have time to spend with them. Yeah. That may mean that the, the schoolmates are not nice to them, perhaps because they are also going through some sort of trauma, which is, again, related to lack of emotional intelligence. Right. And the pressures put on them by yes. society and school and performing all that too. Society does not place any pressures on a child under the age of seven. It is the parents that put the pressure on the child. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. So one last question, because uh, you've been very, very patient. Um, and helpful, thank you. Uh, what we can advise people when this part of them ends this experience here and they don't have to reincarnate here into this game or they choose not to reincarnate here. Yes. Um, there is something talked about by several super soldiers and some have said it has been taken down. And this goes by different names. It was evidently used in a Ryan Wars in the in the past called whatever you want to call it, false light magnetic. The soul trap. Yes. So I'm getting much uh, queries about is that down? As they've said, it's been taken down. What warnings do we need? Is it a question of not going to the light? Uh, you know, how many faking entities are out there? Because basically, I, I feel like when you go to the other side, you also can continue to create your belief system. You know, your, your reality, if you think a certain entity should meet you, they can materialize. So what would be your advice uh, hopefully to somewhat consciously leave your body or, quote, die. First of all, we would say that the Mars component of the soul trap has been deactivated. But there is still another equation of that that exists still, and it is on the moon. So okay. the soul trap still exists. I, uh, it was told by certain emissaries that a year and a half ago that it was taken off the moon and I think Earth and Saturn or something. But so moon is still existing. Yes, it is. But it is hidden and it is well booby trapped. Oh, my goodness. And so this is designed as a soul trap. Yes. Let us say this. There is a lot of light out there after mm -hmm. you dis decide to disincarnate. And what occurs is the soul trap emits the light of beauty 
the frequency of beauty, you might say. And this beauty is very appealing for most souls. They want to go towards something that is beautiful because they haven't seen much of that in their life, perhaps. But for those who have seen beauty in their life and they have had enough of that, they can say, perhaps it just requires acknowledgement that they are already a God and they can go in any direction that they want. They don't need to go into the light to die. They can go literally anywhere else. So it is a misnomer to think that the only place that you go when you die is into the light. You can literally go in any direction. Yes, all the near-deathers who have come back all talked about going toward the light, doing our life review, and in choosing and sometimes having suggested to them to come back into the, the, this body. Uh, what we would say regarding the <clears throat> seeing what they're going to experience in the future and that life review that you just stated, this is, it is a remembrance of what they actually came on earth to do because their consciousness has left the limitation of the physicality. And that is why the information starts to come back to the soul that has been, well, it is in the quantum fluid at that point while it is drifting towards the light. Mm -hmm. And do, do souls ever choose to completely, completely merge back with all and nothing? rather than to maintain any form of identity. Yes, that does occur, but only on rare circumstances. And in this situation, this usually occurs in individuals that have gone from the zero dimension and all processed everything all the way up to the ninth dimension, which is where God is, you might say. And when one finishes the game, uh, such as the Ascended Masters have done, they have the opportunity to now, Cal is not of the ninth dimension, so Cal does not know everything in this regard, but we do know that you have the opportunity to become an angel or to become a part of God, or you can choose to become an ascended master and be put back into the cycle of inca physical incarnation and with some advantage. Uh -huh. Can you choose to be both ascended master and angelic and yes, whole thing? Yes, yeah. but you will not be, well, it is a little bit quantum. Actually, it is be so at this plane of experience, but yes, it is complicated. And what is be so? How do you spell that? What what? A be so is B-I-S-U. B-I-S-U. And is it an acronym for something? And no, it is not. It is a state of consciousness that is beyond quantum. Okay. You had mentioned that earlier. Yes. Thank you so, so much, Cal. Is there any last thing that you feel would be useful for uh, us to hear from your own wisdom at this quantum time? <laughs> There's yes, a lot more on quantum time. <laughs> there is a lot of things to say. Uh, well, we wish each of you have a wonderful life. We want each of you to look at the lighter side of things to not allow yourself to be a victim of any circumstance, but to make change uh, in your life towards what you love, move towards what is good for you, move towards a positive experience and that which is exciting for you. We want each of you to know that you are all powerful, capable beings, eligible for love, and you are deserving of such a thing as well. Do not forget to love yourself. Do not forget to set boundaries. Do not forget to find friends and comrades that are of equal plane to you. Remove malevolent people from your life. Surround yourself with benevolent people. Move forward with uh, love in your heart. Knowing that the world is good, that you can make this world a better place, and you do have the capability and power to do such a thing. If you are more curious and you wish to learn and grow in the aspects of magic, alchemy, understanding of the universe and the way that all things operate within this human system, then you may join the House of El Mystery School. And through the mentorship of the channel, you will learn more and more about yourself and who you have been and what you can attain and who you will ultimately uh, become in your future and while having fun and meeting new people. Uh, that is what we would say our message is for now.
Thank you so much, Cal. Much appreciative of you and all that you are and do and provide for us. I thank you very much for providing the platform for us to speak to you and your viewers. And we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. And we shall return the channel. Yes. Very well. <sighs> that was wonderful <sighs> are you exhausted <laughs> not exhausted just takes me a bit to get my frequency back i bet uh, okay. I, I was going to uh you cal finished for you a promotion okay. for the house of l mystery school training which is Perfect. which is lovely and uh i would like you to to provide contact information for people of sure. Uh, so my email is david underscore lotherington at hotmail.com. I don't have any social media. I'm not on Facebook, not on Insta, not on Twitter, whatever. Um, so I'm hard to find in that regard. I, I choose to live on top of a mountain with my homestead and my pigs and my chickens for a reason. Um, but I do love helping people as much as I can. Um, so my website is davidlotherington.com. And if you want to find some of my YouTube videos, I have a couple there where I'm channeling certain beings and individuals and stuff. Um, that's just type in David Lotherington, then that should come up there. And then do they need your email at all? Is that info provided too? So I believe I gave David underscore Lotherington at hotmail.com, but the school's website, which is currently being procured, as Cal says, um, is T H O E L dot C A. Thole.ca, the house of L.ca. Hmm. But it is T H O E L.ca. Wonderful, wonderful. David, I've had so much fun with you. Talk about fun. I've had so <laughs> much fun with you <laughs> and so appreciate your generosity, a valuable time. You were most generous today. And so for, for all that you are and all that you do, thank you. And folks, thank you for teaming up for our freedom, our fearlessness, and go out there and play more. Until next time, onwards and upwards. Take care. Bye, guys.